Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, like Mark said in his presentation, uh, the paper I'm presenting is on behalf of like multiple co-authors that we that we had, um, who put a lot of effort in writing this paper, including Joe, Alex, Colin, Somu, Prithvi, Jasso, and Doug Terry. And on top of that, the work that is showcased here is the result of a dedicated team effort, which was you know under the guidance of Doug Terry. So I'll try my best to prevent a snooze fest here. So let's start with the poll. How many of you uh, have written applications that use NoSQL databases? Okay, 50% of the room. And how many of you wanted atomic transactions? They existed. Awesome. Okay, for others who never wanted it, let's see why not, why, why you need it. So in this talk, I want to explore a theme which is generally transactions are considered at odds with scalability and, and why they are not added in like a no, lot of NoSQL databases. And not just that, I'll walk you through how different trade-offs we made while adding transactions to DynamoDB. So a quick primer, DynamoDB, like many NoSQL databases, offers a simple API. Typically, you as a customer store data in a key value format where key could point to like a JSON object. And all of the complexity of replicating the data is abstracted behind simple APIs like put and get. There is no fixed schema. You can have like a table where you are storing like product images, you are storing graphs, you are storing like order information, customer information. So there is really no fixed schema. On top of that, it's highly available. Every data, that every item that you store in Dynamo is replicated in multiple availability zones before it's acknowledged back. And it supports unbounded growth. So as a customer, you can start on DynamoDB by creating a table, and we will figure out how much, based on your traffic pattern, we'll figure out how much you know, number of machines are needed, how much capacity you need, and move your replicas based on you know, what traffic you're sending. We will do splits behind the scenes. So it really provides you unbounded growth. And one of the features, like many features that people love about DynamoDB, one of them is predictable performance. So you as a customer can start with like 10 TPS application and go to millions of TPS and still expect single digit millisecond performance. In this talk, the scalability that I refer to is predictable performance at unbounded uh, scale. So those of you who have used transactions, you already know how they simplify application development, but let's just do a quick primer on that. Let's say you're building an online e-commerce application. We're trying to figure out why transactions are valuable. So transactions, they facilitate construction of correct and reliable applications that wish to maintain multi-item invariance. And such multi-item invariance are quite popular in quite common in many applications. Like, let's take the example of online e-commerce application. What would be a multi-item invariant? One of the invariant could be that total number of items that are sold, they are not greater than whatever stock or inventory that you had, right? That's an invariant. Or the cart and checkout process should validate that there is a real customer who is purchasing it and you know the items that are being sold have the right statuses and the total price of the full transaction is matching what the, the actual cost for the e-commerce website owner was, right? And maintaining these invariants in a distributed system is really hard. Why do I say that? Let's say that you are using a NoSQL database where you do not have transactions and you're building the online e-commerce checkout, checkout experience, right? As a customer, you would essentially do writes to all these tables and the checkout experience needs one, verify that the customer exists. Second, whatever object that is being bought, like a book or a pencil, has the right status. The count needs to be updated when the transaction is, um, you know, transaction goes through and then order needs to be created as well. So if you have a single user application where you only have one, one user who is going to use your application, building it with non non-transactional APIs, you can do it, but most of the applications that get built, they have multiple users who are, 
trying to access, which is read and write data at the same time, right? And in case you have clients reading and writing data at the same time, if you don't have the transactional uh, asset semantics, what, what would happen is you might show inconsistent data to the users. For example, a transaction that actually didn't go through was, update, was updating an item, like a book which was being bought. If the transaction didn't actually go through, then that book will be not available to so many customers, which otherwise you could have given, right? So clients reading and writing in parallel creates a challenge, which is concurrent access. On top of that, if you build this application without you know, transactional support, you would have to do a lot of heavy lifting for handling you know, application crashes or network timeouts, whatever are things that, quite, that happen quite commonly in distributed systems. And the way to you know, solve that would be on the client side, you can maintain a ledger and, and do a lot of heavy lifting. So we heard this from customers that you know all these challenges we have to face so we decided okay let's build transactions we understand what what pain point customers are going through so we started with defining our goals with dynamodb transactions essentially what we want is we want to provide full asset compliance to customers where customers can execute a set of operations atomically and in a serializable manner for any items in any tables, it doesn't have to be just like one table which, which they're using or like as, as we saw in the previous example, there were three tables, right? So any items in any tables and also get predictable performance. Customers love predictable performance. So, and another thing is introduction of transactions should not impact existing workloads which do not need transactions. So that was another goal that we added. So with these set of ambitious goals, we started looking at what are the standard approaches that you know, are there to build transactions. Before inventing, we looked at it. So the standard approach, one standard way would be that you provide TX begin, TX commit as an API, and customers can interleave get and put operations in between these two APIs. Similarly, a singleton transaction could all singleton requests that customers do to do a put can also be like an implicit singleton transaction, which is again grabbed behind TX begin and TX commit. Now for, in terms of isolation, standard approach is like two-phase locking, where you, know, as a cus where you can use these two-phase locks to prevent concurrent access. And often databases also store like multi-versions of items so that you, know, you can, to provide like uh, snapshot isolation whenever you do read-only transactions. We rejected all these mainly because DynamoDB is a multi-tenant service and if we allow applications to begin a transaction and end a transaction and let customers put anything in between, these transactions would, could potentially end up holding the resources for a long duration, right? And other thing was we would have we, we would have loved to do multi-version concurrency control, but DynamoDB storage, that's, that would be like a big, big change in, in basically writing the storage engine from scratch again. And if you store multiple versions, now that cost, someone has to pay. So we'll have to you know, pass that cost to the customers. So we didn't want to do that as well. So what we did instead was we introduced two new APIs in DynamoDB one is a transact get item, and second is a transact write item. So the transact get item API allows multiple items to be read from a consistent snapshot, and these items can come again from any arbitrary set of tables that the customer owns. Only committed data is returned whenever you do a transact get item request. Is, uh, yeah, transact get item request. The transact write item operations. It allows multiple items to be created, deleted, or updated atomically. And as a user, you can also specify conditions that, hey, do this put only if the value of a certain attribute is x. Or do this put if the item exists or item doesn't exist. So you can, all, you can do puts with conditions. DynamoDB already supported singleton puts with conditions. But with transactions, we also introduced a new operation called check item what we, 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 the check item operation, what it does is, if you're doing a transaction on three items, which you're updating, but you want to check 
another item which you're not updating as part of the transaction. For example, in the online e-commerce application, you want to just verify whether the customer actually signed up or not. You just want to do a read for that, right? So we introduced check item for that operation. So introducing these, you must be wondering, like, you know, as a customer, when I had TX begin, TX commit, I had so much flexibility, I could do so much in that. So are we losing anything? We had the same question. So we started digging, talking to customers, understanding, to understand if we just provided you these two APIs, would you be able to model whatever transaction you are doing in transact write item and transact get item APIs? And turns out most of the use cases that, that we found out through customer interviews, they can be converted into either transact write item API or they can be modeled with these two APIs. Now, for the shopping cart example that I was giving, a transact write item API call would look something like this, where we are checking in the customer's table whether the customer Suzy exists. We are also checking in the inventory table that the book we are trying to buy, we have five copies of it at least. And then, if these two checks do succeed, we want to put, a, put in the orders table a new order entry and also update the inventory by reducing the number of books sold by five. So this worked well. Now let's take a look at how exactly under the hood transactions work. So before we get into that, let's first take a look at ex like a normal non-transactional like DynamoDB put item operation, how that, that works so that we understand the architecture of Dynamo. So as a customer, you have your app which does a put request. It hits request routers which are the front end nodes in DynamoDB, and those request routers then route the request to storage nodes. So request routers consult a metadata service to find out where the actual partitions which store the item that the customer is trying to put is, is sitting. And there is a concept of a leader. Since the data is replicated in multiple availability zones, there is a concept of a leader replica. So put requests, they all go through to the leader. Leader replicates it to at least two replicas before it acknowledges back to the client. Now get request, you can either do a consistent get or an eventually consistent get. If you do a get consistent get request, it goes to the leader. If you do an eventually consistent get request, it will be served from any of the other two, any of the three replicas. So for transactions, when a customer makes a transact request, transaction request, we the first, it lands on the request router. Request router does the authentication authorization similar to what it did for the normal put item request. And it forwards the request to a transaction coordinator. Transaction coordinator then sends the request to different partitions. Partitions are like for a table, we have multiple partitions which are sitting on different storage nodes. Sends the request, gets the response, and correspondingly respond back to the client. Now, transaction coordinator actually executes a two-phase protocol. In the first phase, which is the prepare phase, it, it asks all the participating storage nodes whether you are willing to accept the part of transaction that is being sent to that particular storage node. And if that request, if, if all the storage nodes respond back saying yes, then the transaction will go to the next phase. And what actually gets checked in this prepare phase is the conditions, like in the online shopping example that I was saying, if you want to check whether Suzy exists, that prepare request would actually go and verify it in the customer's table whether that customer exists or not. And if it does, then it will respond back with a yes. And then once a transaction has passed the prepare phase, it is guaranteed to finish, which means transaction coordinator will try ha as hard as possible to finish the transaction. First, just by sending the commit request, in case there is a timeout or anything happens on the storage nodes, it'll keep retrying. And the commit, commit request is item potent. Any, any transaction coordinator can send the request any, any number of times to make sure the transaction actually goes through. Once it gets an acknowledgement back, it responds back to the request router, which translates back to the client. Now, there are cases where one of the conditions could end up in not being evaluated as true. So prepare request if it fails, corresponding to that, transaction coordinator will send a release request and respond back saying, hey, transaction failed for this particular condition that you specified in the request, that was not true. So this is the high level architecture of how the transaction protocol works. Now for fault tolerance, 
we don't have just a single transaction coordinator. We have multiple transaction coordinators, but there is state for every transaction request that needs to be stored somewhere. So transaction coordinator checkpoints the, the first, when a customer makes a request, it checkpoints it in a ledger, which is again another DynamoDB table. And then there is a recovery manager. So in case a transaction coordinator crashes, recovery manager is continuously finding out pending transactions and making sure there is at least one transaction coordinator assigned to it, send a recover message to transaction coordinator. And as I said, if a transaction has gone to the, to the prepare phase, transac any transaction coordinator can make the commit call. So we talked about the, how recovery process handles atomicity, but how do transactions execute in a serial order? So for that, for serializability, we decided to borrow a technique called timestamp ordering, and this approach has been credited to both David Reed and Phil Bernstein. It has, it dates back about 40 years, and we adopted timestamp ordering to the key value store. So let's look at it, what exactly we did. So the basic idea is that transaction coordinator will assign a timestamp to each transaction, and the, the timestamp is the value of the coordinator's current clock. And the assigned timestamp therefore defines the serial order of all transactions. Quite simply, as long as a transaction execute at their assigned time, the serializability is achieved. Now, if the storage node can accept a request, the transaction coordinator picks up the timestamp, also sends it in the prepare request, and storage node will store that timestamp durably before it acknowledges back in the prepare phase. And when the next phase, the, the, in the commit request, once a timestamp has been assigned and preconditions are checked, the node participating in the transaction can do their work independently. So transact get items, as I said, we have transact write item and transact get item protocol, these two. So transact, the read transactions are also performed using a two-phase protocol, though it is done in a slightly different manner. The standard timestamp order, if we had used the standard timestamp ordering technique, in that case, we would have converted every read to a write because, as I said, when we do a prepare, the timestamp that is being sent, they are stored durably on storage nodes. We didn't want to do it. So what we did instead was, we still do a two-phase protocol, but instead of storing those timestamps durably, transaction coordinator, when they make a request, the prepare phase request to the storage node, storage node responds back with the log sequence number, which is the sequence number of the replication log of each partition, and in the commit phase, it again goes and talks to the storage node, passing that same log sequence number and asks that, hey, has anything changed? If nothing has changed, then it responds back to the client with the same data. If things have changed, then it will retry again. Now, in practice, to handle the overall transaction load, as I said, we have multiple transaction coordinators. So you must be wondering, what if there is a time, like, what if there is a time drift, right? So different transactions accessing overlapping set of items can be assigned timestamps by different coordina coordinators, but serializability still holds true even though the, the coordinators do not have synchronized clocks. But still there is one downside, which is if one of the transaction coordinator has a timestamp which is way ahead in future, then all the other transaction coordinators which have the right time, they'll, if they send a request, all of them will be rejected because timestamp ordering, you know, you have certain rules to accept transactions. So we have put guardrails in place, things like we try to find out transaction coordinators which are way ahead in future in time and storage nodes will reject requests from those nodes if, if, they, if they come up. And we also, ha if there is a drift on detected on a transaction coordinator, we, we excommunicate that node from the fleet. So what are the rules for accepting these transactions? In the next few slides, I'm going to show timelines for like multiple items, and each item, for example, in this case, we have item A, B, and C. The TXA is the time at which transaction A completed on that item. TXB is a time which is a little bit recent than TXA was completed, and TXC has a transaction which completed a while back and a running transaction right now. So if a new transaction comes in with the time TX new, these, this particular transaction will be accepted or rejected based on the timestamp that is assigned by the transaction coordinator to TXNew and existing timestamp that is stored durably on storage nodes. 
So what exactly that means? So if the transaction that comes in with a timestamp lesser than TX1, which was already completed, it'll be rejected. But if it, which is very rare, which doesn't happen, but in case it happens, we have storage node code to handle this as well. What commonly happens is a transaction coordinator will send a request with a timestamp higher than the existing timestamp of the, of the last write that was done, and also it will have conditions. If the conditions that are specified, they are evaluated to true, the transaction will be accepted. If not, and the transaction will be rejected. And there are a bunch of optimizations we have also talked about in paper around like how we can have multiple transactions, concurrent write transactions that can happen in, in, uh, on a single item. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but at high level, again, a single transaction gets rejected if it, if it has a lower timestamp. There are cases where we could actually accept a transaction, even though we have accepted TX2, a new transaction with a lower timestamp can be accepted, provided TX2 was accepted, was an unconditional uh, write that was already accepted, and TX new conditions are also met. Again, but the more common case here also is you have a transaction with a higher timestamp and you accept those. For non-transactional workloads, we also had a goal that we do not want to impact anything on, and like we do not want to, we want to make sure there is no impact on the latency of non-transactional workloads. So for those, the normal path of application talking to request router, request router talking to storage node works the same, and storage nodes evaluate the same timestamp rules for these non-transactional writes as well. How does it work? How has it been performing in production? If you look at the comparison of latencies, so this particular test we did is increasing the throughput of transactions from 100K operations per second to 1 million operations per second. And you can see that latencies, P50, P90, all these latencies you see very little variance. The P99 latencies, even though they look bigger in the graph, it's actually very like within two millisecond difference. And most of it is because each node is actually taking more load. Now we are sending 1 million IOPS per second. That's why you see the tail latencies to be higher. So revisiting scalability and predictable performance, get put items, we are able to get the same as existing customers experience with DynamoDB, transact get items. It's a two-phase protocol. So you see, again, consistent performance as even if you keep increasing your uh, workloads and transact write items have slightly higher because for every transact write item request, we are also using the ledger to store the request and then you know do all the checkpointing. So in conclusion, DynamoDB supports full ACID transactions and working backward from customers informed us that long running transactions was not something that is really required and whatever we implemented to see if tra our transactions that are at object scalability, the answer is no. This work shows that transactions implemented in replicated, part replicated partitions, NoSQL database, can be achieved with high scalability, high availability, and predictable performance. Thank you.